Next, I want to show you recursive utility. This is a very popular modification of the utility function uh, that shows up in a lot of work in asset pricing. The key is that it is non-separable across states of nature. Uh, habit utility is non-separable across time. Yesterday's consumption affects today's marginal utility. This is non-separable across states of nature in that utility in one, uh, consumption in one state of nature will affect marginal utility in another state of nature. Uh, the utility function is written this way. There's con today's consumption and then tomorrow's utility uh, that goes through this nonlinear aggregator. If this were a linear function here, then just today's consumption and tomorrow's utility, you could iterate that forwards and get back to power utility. So power utility is a special case when that aggregator is linear. Uh, instead, we have a CES aggregator between today's consumption and tomorrow's utility, and that nonlinearity uh, in this second term is what drives the interesting features of this utility function. Uh, take some algebra, which I'm not going to do in front of you, um, but you, which you'll go through, to get from that utility function to marginal utility, uh, mt plus 1. But let's look at the result. When you take marginal utility, or marginal utility growth, you get the discount factor, that's nice. Consumption growth to a power. So once again, what we're getting is first the power utility term and then something else. And the something else is the increase in this, the, the unexpected change in this utility index. So as I promised last time, as with habits, we have consumption growth to one power and some other variable, uh, the growth in some other variable as a second shock. And that's going to let us have covariances with this thing drive risk premiums, uh, something new and different relative to power utility. Now, uh, the problem in using this is that the expected utility tomorrow is, is a hard thing to measure. So uh, how do we measure expected utility tomorrow? How do we measure that second shock? One very nice trick, again, it takes some algebra, but you can see where it's going, is to use the rate of return on a consumption claim. The, the value of consumption is going to be intuitively related to the uh, utility that you get. More consumption, more utility, more value of that consumption stream. So you can, in fact, use the rate of return of a consumption claim to uh, measure that uh, growth in expected utility. So that now allows us to put in consumption growth and uh, an asset return, covariance with this asset return, can help us to drive risk premiums. The last major analytical result is that, at least as an approximation, we can, uh, our, whole, our whole job is how do we, um, how do we measure this uh, change in the utility index. You can also measure it from consumption itself. So this is a linearization that changes in the log uh, marginal utility are the power utility term again, right? Changes in consumption growth. And then another term, changes in expectations of future consumption growth that don't affect today's consumption. So here what we're doing is we are again measuring this change in utility index, but we're measuring it by measuring the consumption uh, that happens in the future, not just the rate of return on, on some asset, which proxies uh, for consumption growth. Uh, so in this one, it, uh, it, it's a, it, this is a nice statement of the economics. It says, what are people scared about? They're scared that asset returns fall when consumption growth falls, but they're also scared that asset returns fall when they get news about long-run future consumption that isn't reflected in today's consumption. So that becomes the extra factor that people are scared about. So some, some features and some thoughts about this whole class of models. Uh, first, notice if consumption growth is IID, um, then it all reduce, this reduces to power utility. There are no, if consumption growth is IID, there are no changes in expectations of future consumption growth not measured in today's consumption growth. It relies on dynamics uh, past IID in consumption growth to get anything going. Second, uh, this variance in the Sharpe ratio, conditional heteroscedasticity of the discount factor, that's what we saw in, in, in habits is, is the thing driving uh, uh, predictability regressions. Uh, you can see here that's going to have to come from uh, conditional heteroscedasticity of the consumption process itself. It's not going to, this isn't going to generate a time varying risk aversion all on its own. You have to have time varying risk 
to generate that factor. And, and the papers do. The papers posit that there's time-varying volatility of consumption growth. Third, my, my own doubt, is there really, is this really the story? In, in the financial crisis, when everybody got scared and, and prices went down, uh, were they scared because of what was happening today or because of news of the far-off future that had nothing to do with what's happening today? Uh, I've always found that hard to swallow. Um, the, the dark, it's been called dark matter, news about something in the far-off future that isn't reflected in any event today. Well, that's what's going on, um, and, and you have to take your own stand on if you like it or not. The preferences uh, are, they came out of the theory literature, the, those preferences there, and they have a feature in them. People care to learn about uh, uncertainty, the preference for early resolution of uncertainty. You, you care, you're willing to pay money to find out what's going to happen to you, even though you can't do anything about it. And you can decide if you think that's a feature or a bug of these preferences. A big reason people use them, the, the main reason for their popularity, is they separate the elasticity of intertemporal substitution from risk aversion. You can see that right here. Gamma is the risk aversion uh, coefficient. Rho is the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. And, and you saw in the equity premium puzzle the tension between those two things. We wanted a big risk aversion to account for, for equity premiums. We wanted a low elasticity of intertemporal substitution because interest rates don't vary that much over time. It seems like people are willing to substitute consumption over time easily, but not across states of nature. And, and the big popularity, I think, of this utility function is not in all its other uh, um, uh, effects is that it allows you conveniently to separate those two effects. But I would point out, so does habit. Uh, so this is a utility function that does that, but it's not the only utility function that allows you to separate those things and have constant interest rates despite high and time-varying risk premiums. Uh, another point, the, the index we have to use here, uh, this index here is related to total consumption, not just non-durable and services consumption. We got along in using just non-durable and services here on, on using the separability across goods, but you can't do that here. This index has to be total consumption, and so you have, you have to figure that out. Uh, last point, you might say, wait a minute, I, I knew about models where news matters. That's the ICAPM. The ICAPM says there's more state variables, which are news about future investment opportunities, uh, and that those more state variables enter. This is not the ICAPM. And the reason is because what matters is news about future consumption not reflected in current consumption. The ICAPM is just a special case of the consumption-based model where, where we look at the news variables that cause people to eat less today, and we look at those news variables directly. So the ICAPM has none of that and puts news variables in because they affect today's consumption. So this is different from the ICAPM. You, you, this model really writes down that news about the future, not reflected in anything going on today, is what people are afraid of. Mm -hmm.